All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. I'm Mike Davis, and our guest today is Gwendolyn Keist. Hi, Gwendolyn. Hello. Thank you again for having me. I'm so, so excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, let's do prizes and introductions and then talk to Gwendolyn, and we've actually got uh, something more or less urgent to talk about before we do that. So uh, let's start with SP and work our way over. <clears throat> I'm SP Miskowski, and I write fiction. Rick? Rick Lay, writer. And Philip? Uh, Philip Fergassi, screenwriter and author of Behold the Void. Matt? Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I have a neat prize today in honor of Caitlin Kiernan. If you don't know, her papers are being donated to the John Hay Library at Brown University August 16th, which is sort of the first day-ish of uh, Necronomicon. Mm -hmm. There's a reception from 5 to 8.30 p.m. I'll post a link on the web page. And she's making remarks with Derek Hussey at 6 p.m. Allegedly, there will be light refreshments, which basically means Cheetos, I guess. Anyway, for a prize today, I have a wonderful book, Dear Sweet Filthy World, which is her latest collection from Subterranean Press. And this is a limited numbered edition signed by the author. That's a great prize. I so, have that book. It's awesome. So there you have it. Uh, right. Because her papers are being donated and uh, uh, sort of a tip of the hat to Necronomicon. But here's a chance to get some of that great author's works. And the boards okay. on that book are like leather. It's really nice. Sorry, geeking out. I think that's everybody. Um, oh, sorry, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Young, uh, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. All right, so for those who don't know, uh, Joe Pulver is in the hospital. And I don't want to really say much more than that, but it's pretty serious. Um, and hopefully he gets through it okay. I... I think we'll find out more tomorrow is what I've heard from his wife from Kat. So uh, I posted a link to his GoFundMe to him and Kat's GoFundMe uh, page. If you feel like helping with the hospital bills and, and uh, to paraphrase Kat, um, the whole thing's scary and the hospital bills, even with insurance are really scary. So um, I also posted a link to Nick Gucker's, um, online art store. Uh, Nick Gucker lost his job uh, a few weeks or so ago. And, you know, if you're, if you like his stuff, if you're in the market for something new, check it out because that'll support him as well. And a little bit later, I think we're going to talk more about Joe. But for now, let's talk to Gwen. Hey, Gwen. Hello. <laughs> uh, let me read your bio from the back of your, your book here. Um, <laughs> Gwendolyn Keist is a speculative fiction author based in Pennsylvania. A uh, native o of Ohio, she currently dwells on an abandoned horse farm outside of Pittsburgh with her husband, two cats, and not nearly enough ghosts. I like that bio. <laughs> My cats are like ghosts, too. We had to like keep them out of the room or they'd be like crawling all over the computer right now, curious what was going on. So. Oh, yeah, I have to keep a squirt bottle next to me because somehow they know I can't get next to, I can't get up from the chair and they'll do things they're not supposed to do. <laughs> so that's one of the Mike Davis preparations for this podcast. For anyone who wants to know. podcasts have cats crawling all over them on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's start with SP. I know SP has some questions for you. Then we'll go from there. Yes, I do. Um, well, first of all, I'm a brand new fan of yours, Gwendolyn, um, because as I was saying, um, I read your short story in Black Static, number 58, and um, I'm not exaggerating. I was completely blown away. It's uh, called Songs to Help You Cope When Your Mom Won't Stop Haunting You and Your Friends. 
And I thought, well, that's clever. And <laughs> then I saw the songs and I started reading and I, and I admired the sort of formal structure of, you know, dividing it up by songs. Um, but by the end of it, I, I'll tell you what, I just, I, I think the hairs were standing up on my arms. <laughs> it was just really, really beautiful, beautiful. And so I immediately started looking around to see what other magazines I had and anthologies I had that had your stories in them. <clears throat> and I've been binging on your work ever since. And I bought your collection, your Journal Stone collection. Um, just just been binging on Gwendolyn Keist stories this weekend. And the thing that I that I, I find so engaging, uh, one of the things I find so engaging is that you a lot of your stories seem to deal with family and family relationships, but <clears throat> not in a mundane way at all. Your approach is very fresh, and um, you sort of look at families by exploring um, an unfamiliar or strange element or some sort of uh, bizarre uh, transformation. And so I, I guess what I wanted to ask you, first of all, about your your voice and your style and this way of writing. <clears throat> did you gradually develop your own way of telling stories or did it come naturally from the start? And did you study writing or did you have a mentor? How did you, how did you begin to write? I really just started writing whenever I was very young. That was really how, how it started. I'm trying to think. I, I've had a, I have had some formal training. I don't have an MFA or anything like that, so not like the the extent of formal training that I know so many people have. But I I have taken some classes, you know, some college college level classes on on fiction writing and a lot on literature. So I found a lot of just writing essays, academic essays, have sort of helped guide me along. And. <laughs> So yeah, and, and some of those some of those instructors were really helped guide me in, in the direction to go with with publishing. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of my voice, I think it was a little bit of both that I both you know started uh, trying to figure out exactly where I wanted to go with it with the different types of relationships and exploring those relationships. And you know, I found initially I wrote a lot of different styles, and really it was that kind of a style that I found resonated most with me and that readers seem to respond to the most. So I'm like, if that's what readers like and it's what I like the most, then maybe that's, you know, really where where my my voice really is is its strongest. Mm -hmm. And I like to use the word transformation because I think that's a lot of my stuff. There's body horror in it and mm -hmm. some of the stuff. Not necessarily in the black static story, but in some of my other stuff, those transformations are very much part of part of what I really I really Reasons enjoy. I Hate My Big Sister from Night yes. Night Script Two. That yeah. was wonderful. That yeah. was wonderful. Oh, thank you. How did that? How did that start? What was the? What was the? The, the trigger or the impulse. You know, I was thinking about uh, David Cronenberg's version of The Fly, and then also thinking about the Virgin Suicides, and mm -hmm. thinking about how sort of combining the elements of like transformation of somebody you really care about, but with sisters. And so mm -hmm. that was sort of like the the vibe I went went with with that. And then I also thought even of the movie Ginger Snaps, which you know I, mm -hmm. I always liked how how that was really dealt with body horror and adolescence and two sisters. So it was sort of that. Mm -hmm that combination of, of different, of different uh, sources. And I was like, okay, let's see what I can do with this. It's so. very interesting. It's immediately engaging. And, and the, the transformation is bizarre. One of the sisters is going through something that is, that is really sort of, sort on one level, monstrous and bizarre, but the core of the story is the relationship between the two sisters. Mm -hmm. And so I, you never lose sight of, of that you know the core is always about human life it's about mortality it's about yeah. our connections to one another so that's that's something you know that really that i was drawn in by the the charm of the structure you know but and, you know it, you, we're listing numbers i mean if you how does that one start does it start with number 17 yeah. reasons oh. reasons i hate my big sister and it starts number 17 <laughs> 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 so you're immediately drawn into that but then you know what you get from it is so much more there's it's so full and so complex um 
I also read your essay, A Place Both Wonderful and Strange, The Suburban Gothic Worlds of David Lynch and Shirley Jackson, which was um, in the new issue of Unnerving Magazine. Yes. So I just was uh, curious. I wanted to know if you, uh, have you always sort of seen Lynch and Jackson as um, sort of sources or of inspiration or I have. have they sort of been there in the back of your mind? Yes, yes. In particular, uh, David Lynch, since the time I was really in college, even before that, even in high school. Shirley Jackson, I've really only discovered in like the last five or six years, mm -hmm. which seems so strange to me now that like, and I, I feel like even other authors I've talked to, a lot of people are saying that they've really only, some people have only discovered in the last few years, which is so strange when you realize like we've mm -hmm. all read the lottery. We almost all read it at some point in high school or college, but it's like mm -hmm. to really discover the rest of her work. So yeah, she's more recent on all, but David Lynch has, yeah, sort of been there since I saw Racerhead, which was just so, so strange. I was from a small town. There were things like that that in small towns, so it was like, wow, this is totally different. So it was very, very uh, jarring, but exciting at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was very interesting, the things that you had to say about the suburban Gothic, um, which, I, you know, fascinates me, too. I mean, I'm very interested in families and that sort of cut-off world of the suburbs. It, it seems like it's the center of everything, but actually it's kind of a different reality. It is. It absolutely is. And that's, you know, sort of where I more grew up because I didn't grow up in more of an urban area. I live in a rural area now, but like where I grew up was more of that suburban type of feel. And yeah, it seems like it's like the center of things, but really it's it's not. It's sort of in between, but everybody who's sort of in it, it is, it's like its own little, little micro. Its own bubble sort of, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. and I love your description of, uh, you know, Mary Cat looking at the, the, the trains going through or any, you know, the traveling through and there's that allure of possibility, but at the same time, it's a strange world out there and it's terrifying, you know, and that, that sense of being stuck. I thought that was, that was very apt. Um, the, uh, the th another thing that really impressed me about the Black Static story, story was and, um, I did, how much research did you do and how did you research it? What did you do to prepare? Because it feels, so, everything is right. I mean, everything you've just created, you know, going, it, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but to set a story in the 1970s and firmly set it there is, uh, is pretty challenging. Yeah, that, that was something that like, that, like it, was it was interesting, interesting because, because I really went I in, really went in that can you guys hear me? Let me know. Let me know. Uh huh. Can you hear me? I can, can hear, you hear me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I'm getting some reverb over, over here. So so. I really I went really into it and, and really and there's really so much available much online available. now. So hey, I was well, able well, to find well, 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 Why don't you try to turn it down? Your speaker speaker speaker. Speaker. Turn it down. No, actually we're echoing we're echoing SPs. Why don't you? Are we? Do you want me to turn mine off while I'm? Yeah. There we go. Okay, is that better? Yep, just a temporary glitch. Okay. It'll probably fix itself. Okay. Um, so I really just went, the, initially just went online and just looked at a lot of different uh, video and articles and pictures and really sort of went through there. And for the songs, I, I've always loved that era of music. So that really made it a lot easier to already know a lot of that. At one point in my life, I wanted to be a rock and roll historian. That was like the thing that I wanted to do. So that was, uh, so that sort of gave me a, gave me an opportunity as an outlet for that. So, yeah. Unmute myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> are you, are you working on a novel? Do I you am. Have a novel yeah. coming out? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm working on the Rust Maidens. That's going to be coming out through Trepidation yeah, Publishing. So next your, your okay. Butt, your butt dancer, and we're really getting some feedback in yours. We are. There we go. Okay. So yeah, that'll be out next year from from Trepidatio Publishing, which is an imprint of Journal Stone. So I'm going to be working with editor Jess Landry on that. So that's also going to be set in sort of the same era as the Black Static story. Great. Yeah, Jess is terrific. She's she's wonderful. Um, so, could you want to talk a little bit about the novel, about uh, what it's about, or do you want to yeah. wait on that? No, we'll, we, yeah, absolutely. We can talk about that. <laughs> 
so yeah, so it's going to be set in 1980 in Cleveland. So the same thing as the Black Static story, which is sort of basically that same year. And it's going to be a lot of body horror, sort of coming of age, really talking about the Rust Belt, which is where I'm, I'm from, because I'm from Ohio, and really talking about that. And sort of it's both like an ode to that. And I also see sort of like a, like a, a poisoned love letter to it, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad from that area. And, and so really talking about that and exploring that in my own relationship to that area. And, and then also, you know, really looking at those kind of family relationships as, as these girls in this neighborhood start transforming and sort of like to blend in almost with the background. So that's the idea of the Rust Maidens as they start actually becoming almost what the embodiment of what the, of the, what the Rust Belt is. So they sort of become like they start sort of rusting and rotting and decaying. So that's, that's the, uh, that's, that's the hook there, right? That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. I, I can't wait. Um, what about <clears throat> another story of yours that I listened to on Tales to Terrify uh, was Black Door. That was, that's peculiar. What, I, I mean, I loved it. It was really, it was fascinating. Where did that come from? That's funny. I was just talking about that one to like my my parents because they were asking about that one recently because it did just come out from Tales to the Terrify. It was actually only my second published story. So it's like a, that's like several years ago now. And um, so yeah, that one actually it was partially inspired by the Hopkinsville Goblins, which are like this thing in Kentucky where all these these creatures supposedly descended on this in this house and they still have like a yearly festival for it and everything and they were like these really small weird little things that you couldn't really like these goblins that you couldn't really kill and i think the movie gremlins was sort of loosely based on this phenomenon too and i sort of wanted to take you know my own my own take on that especially since i live in a really rural area and i'm like what would happen if these really strange creatures like descended on us here like it's it's very odd when like i didn't grow up in the country so living in the country now that i'm i'm older is very odd it's a very much an adjustment so it's it's kind of eerie because it's so quiet at times that you have to you you wonder what's out there you wonder what's going on i i thought the story was it was pretty creepy, but I love the way that you toyed with mm, how much of it was real and how mm. much of it might have been just, you know, a projection or psychological. And these people, um, the kids are starting to find evidence, you know, it just sort of builds and builds into this really, really disturbing tale. You start off with the claw marks around the door. Is that how yeah, it starts. yeah, it starts yeah. off. That's actually like the first image I had of it was like this black door with all these claw marks on it. And that was sort of the image that I started with, like, well, what would cause that? How would that happen? And I sort of wanted to explore it from there. Is that usually how you start? Is there like one um, image or one character, or one moment that you begin with? Very often, yeah, it's it's an image. It's a very specific image. With that one, it was the the, the black door with the claw marks on it. With a, a story from my collection called the Clawfoot Requiem, it was it was a bathtub full of blood. That was the image that I saw. And I'm like, whoa, what's the what's the story there? And wanted to go with that. In my story, uh, the ghost story, Audrey at Night, that's also in my collection. It was just this idea of this ghost sort of like scratching across the floor. And and I'm like, okay, well, what's the story here? Like, especially you know, is this this idea of a ghost at night coming to haunt somebody and I'm like okay I, I want to explore that from there so yeah a lot of times it is a specific image and when you put your collection together um, I won't touch that okay um, when you put your collection together what specifically did you have in mind or did you did you work with Jess on this on the collection yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we worked yeah. Uh, we worked together on the collection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what were you sort of? I mean, what made you decide to keep a story in? What made you just decide to leave a story out? What were you sort of centering around with the collection or hoping to do? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Um, I do a lot of it is death and rebirth. And like we said, a lot of transformations, a lot of things like that. So it was really looking at which stories that I always say this is the the unfun part, but looking at which stories I had the rights to. That's that's obviously the first thing, the completely practical, not quite as fun part. But that was like the first thing. And from there, really looking and feeling like, okay, you know, what fits with all these themes? A lot of them, pretty much all of them have like a pretty strong female protagonist. You know, there's some kind of some kind of like horrible transformation they're going through, whether it's body horror or there's something in the in the environment. A couple of them are sort of dystopic. So really looking at that and saying, okay, which one of these sort of fit together and 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 going from there well i just want to say again i i'm hooked i'm a fan this is um this is really exciting you know i sort of uh, i was sort of pushed to go ahead and pick up the story that i that i had here that i intended to read because mike uh, was having you on the show <clears throat> and boy i'm glad uh because it's really interesting, really, really dynamic and refreshing and very interesting work. And um, so I'm just going to take all my Gwen Keist books and just <laughs> go <laughs> off in the corner and read. And you guys can talk, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, I have a couple questions, if you don't mind. Um, sure, go ahead, Matt. Uh, so what's your background? Were you like, uh, did you like get formal training in... Uh, a college degree program, or have you always just sort of been writing for fanzines and magazines? I haven't been writing for fanzines and magazines for very long. My background is actually in psychology, so I have a master's degree in psychology. That's where most of my formal training is. Then, like I said, here and there, I picked up like a literature class or a writing class, so there's definitely been some formal training in there, but most of the formal training has been actually more like social sciences, and so that's that's sort of my background, which I, I still think can help you as a writer very much, but it's it's sort of like a more of a tangent of it, so yeah. Um, do you have any interests in other media? Um, like, do you write uh, poetry at all, or are you thinking about doing uh, screenplays or anything like that? Are you in theater at all? I actually started as a filmmaker. That was what I did um, late teens, early 20s. And that, that's how I met my husband. That's how I really got started in horror. But I was a pretty terrible filmmaker. Like I wasn't able to really properly transfer my vision in onto the screen. So it was like, I, I tried it for a number of years and I feel bad for the actors that I put through that because I don't feel like I was nearly, I think I'm a much better prose writer um, than, I, than I was a filmmaker. But I love film. I absolutely love film. I love it as a medium and I, I admire filmmakers so much because it's not something I felt like I was really good at. So yeah, so that, yeah. that's definitely something I did. Inquiring minds want to know, of course, are any of these little film snippets on YouTube or anything like that? Are no, they aren't. Thank, wow. thank goodness. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks, SP. Great questions. And Matt. Um, I noticed something in your acknowledgments uh, that I'd like to ask you about. A particularly hearty thank you goes out to a lifetime of naysayers and tormentors who pushed me down and told me to change, to be like them, to be normal. If not for your negative voices, I would not have the impetus to craft these 14 tales of outsiders rising up to face the darkness. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yes, yes, I can. It was very I'm not putting you on the spot, am I? <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It's in the acknowledgments, right? So that that's right. definitely leaving it open. So really growing up in a small town, like there's part of me that's very grateful for it now because I feel like it did give me a very different perspective on things. But at the same time, I also felt like, you know, when you are different in a small town in any way, it I mean, when you're different anywhere, really, I mean, it's, there's, it's not easy anywhere for people who are different. But then in a small town, I just, there was a lot of bullying and, and some of it didn't all come necessarily from other students. Some of it came from people in the administration at, at my school and my high school in particular. And so, you know, there were just some things that happened that like really upset me that I felt very much like it was like, 
you know, you need to change that the way you are isn't right. You know, I, I would get called down into the office, even though I was a straight A student. It's like, oh, the clothes you're wearing, those are those are inappropriate. And they weren't that inappropriate. I'd go to the mall in them. They weren't that bad. But th things like that, a lot of just right. little things here and there, some of them that you can't even ever say, OK, this this is it. A lot of it was like small microaggressions from people. So it was a lot of things like that 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 went on that it was very hard. It was hard at times to, to, to grow up in in a small town. Again, I'm grateful for it now. Like I say in the acknowledgments, like it gave me a lot of fodder for being a for being an outsider. And I think that it gives you a lot of empathy then for even for people who are going through things that are nothing like, you know, it's a lot of different forms of being an outsider in the world, unfortunately. And so it, I feel like, you know, then you feel a lot more camaraderie with other people who might be going through things like that. So did that those experiences formulate the novel that you were talking about? It sounds like it might be akin to the same sort of, uh, you know, past aggression. Yes, I, I would definitely say so. Yeah, I very much feel like that. They do, it definitely plays into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, okay. For, oh, for sorry. those listening, I'm sorry, go ahead, Matt. You can, you can go ahead. Well, I was just wondering, you know, it gets back to the uh, question of other media because you know, even a casual search on YouTube uncovers dramatic readings um, of at least two of your stories. And uh, some of them are prettied up with a little bit of music. Um, I was wondering, is this something that you're into perhaps creating radio dramas of your work or uh, radio screenplays or? I, I would love to hear them done, certainly. I don't know that I'm eager to create them, though, but that I love the medium a lot. I love the medium a lot. I, I think at least one of them that's on YouTube is from the Wicked Library, and they do a really nice job with, with theirs. They're, they do a great job, so, yeah. So I, I like other people to do them, but not, not so sure I, I want to be the one doing the creating. <laughs> um, for those listening who didn't catch it, I'm not sure if we've even mentioned the title yet of your collection. It's and her smile will untether the universe. Um, and I've linked to it in the podcast summary. Um, I have to say that when I start highlighting in a book, I know it's somebody that I want to get a hold of and ask if they want to be on the show. There, there's some great phrases in here that just really stopped me. Um, if somebody were to see me reading this book and ask me what it was, I guess my response would be a lot of the stories seem to be uh, dark fantasy, dark fairy tales uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. Would you agree with me in that or disagree with me? I definitely think a lot of them, yeah, very much are in that, that dark, dark fairy tale, dark fantasy area. Yeah, I, I very much think so. That's that's how I would I would describe it in, in, in many ways. I mean, there's some horror, some more straight horror in there, and there's some things that are certainly like more weird fiction, I think. But yeah, I think dark fantasy, dark fairy tale is absolutely a, a fair way of describing it. Well, without any spoilers, can we? Can I ask you about the inspiration behind some of these stories? Uh, the first one that really made me uh, sit up and think was 10 questions to know about the 10 questions. How in the world did you come up with that story? That's pretty unique. <laughs> 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 that one, uh, because of my psychology background, I knew I wanted to do something with like a questionnaire, like a psychological questionnaire. And I had been trying to figure out how to do it. And then I thought if I try to do it from this sort of coming of age perspective, that that could be really interesting. And then from there, it really just took on this very sort of dystopic feel that I, I didn't initially anticipate when I started writing it, but they just very naturally developed with these mass disappearances and, and this, this questionnaire that was trying to decide, you know, how, how are, why are these people disappearing and sort of like, how can we, how can we determine who's, who's going to disappear next? And again, with this idea of, of trying to control and, and some of those things that have had that happen in there and how oppressive that that high school is is very much how i felt whenever whenever i was young and just wanting so badly to sort of get out of that to go to the next step to go to where you know to get out of there and in in the case of the characters some of them are disappearing to get out of there so so that that was sort of where i was coming from with, with that one in particular with what you just said about high school i can see that in the tower princesses as well 
Yes, yes, very much, very much, because there's there's a very oppressive classroom in there, too. So, yeah, both of those have those, like, sort of separate classrooms where here are the people who are different, and we have to get them out and away from the normal kids, and that's right. what they try to do with the girls in the Tower Princesses, too. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that story? Because that one was hard for me to read, and I'm sure it's deliberately meant to be hard for the reader. Um, I don't like to say deliberately, but yes, I do feel like that's the way it sort of ended up being. Yeah. And that, that one's very, very polarizing because I've had people who say, you know, it was, it was a very hard read, but I'm grateful that I read it. And other people who are like, you know, I read reviews of it online that really hated it when it came out in Interzone last year. Like, this is ridiculous. This is unrealistic. Really? terrible yeah some people seemed really kind of angry at me about it which i still feel like is probably you know it's still a good reaction at least you're getting something visceral yeah. from someone what were they angry about so yeah that one really came from this idea of how we try to protect girls from the world and i initially sort of imagined it as like okay what would that look like if it sort of became real if, if, if this tower did form around them like how people want to protect them and then at the same time then that becomes something that separates them and makes them so they're they're ostracized for it but then also sort of becomes a form of their own protection so it ended up taking on a few different layers as i sort of went and, and wrote it that i almost wasn't expecting initially but i was very I, I was happy with how it turned out and like i said it's been interesting that one a lot of times it like hits people either like they're like this is terrible i hate this or they're like wow you know that was really that was really different than, the, than your other work so you you said that it made some of some people angry what in particular did they say what they were angry about or they just didn't like the story therefore they were mad <laughs> I actually think it was because there's there's obvious allusions to sexual assault in there. I, I right. mean, and I think some people actually just I think at least one reviewer said it was just ridiculous stuff like this never happens, and I'm like, what? What, what world is he living in? Like, okay, I'm not gonna be. Able, I, I would never respond to a reviewer, anyways. I I think that that's not going to help or is appropriate as a writer. People have their opinions. That's fine, right, but that right. one I was like. Okay, like I'm not even, I would never respond to this person anyways, but that's probably for the best. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a flabbergasting yeah. review. Yeah. That it never happened. <laughs> that was my reaction right. too. <laughs> um, the topic what? of, I'm sorry, Mike, I was just going to say no, the topic, no, of please go ahead. Sexual, topic of sexual assault and fiction overall is quite a polarizing one it's 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 a dicey topic and as a writer you run into editors mm -hmm. who don't care the context and don't care and they're not saying right or wrong but they just they'll dismiss the story out of hand if it has a sexual assault in it of any kind and and i think and that's in, you know that's horror you know in the horror genre so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a dicey it's a trick it's a I should say it's a risky thing to do as a as a writer, um, and I think riskier, depending on the what the sexual assault is. But if it's against a woman and you're a male, then it's really risky. And if uh, it's a little less risky if you're a woman and you're writing about a woman's sexual assault. But um, yeah, I find it very a little bit annoying that a reviewer would pick that out as being an issue because they or pick that out in the way they did. Mm -hmm. Especially given the fact that if it's something that if they're reviewing books for a living, um, they should have a, you know, they sh the trigger warning should be pretty dulled by now, I would think. But it, it's interesting when you brought that up because I always thought that it's something that I have to really think about before I put something like that into a story. Not that it comes up a lot, but when it does come up, uh, I'm always extremely cautious about it because I know that it is an incredibly polarizing thing, and and the people a lot of people slam the book close, you know, uh, and be done with you forever. Um, so it's, it, you have to kind of pick your battles on that one. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Absolutely. And that, that was something even when writing that story that I thought, you know, that's going to limit a lot of the markets right off the bat with even wanting to explore it, even though it's not explicit at all in the story. I mean, it's, it doesn't go into a lot of detail or anything like that, but it is there. And I, I, I expected that. And I, I agree. And whenever I, I think, okay, if I'm going to write, anything with with sexual assault really really taking the time of being like this has to be dealt with in the absolute most respectful manner possible because it is it's a very hard subject absolutely yeah and it's disappointing because i mean 
it's real. It's you know, to, which, to Mike's point, it does happen, and I think that there's a you know, if it's gratuitous and it doesn't, you know, if you're going Game of Thrones on it, I can see some of the anger. But if you're if it's part of the character development or part of the development of this, you know, what you need to, ha you know, something that needs to happen to propel this story to get the story where you want it to be emotionally um or even structurally or you know plot you know from a plot perspective um you know i think that i think that it, it kind of goes back to the you know the the americanized version of of media which is you know you can chop off someone's head and drink the blood out of their you know neck hole but if you show a tit like people they're done you know it's it's i think i think i think you kind of have to either take it all or you don't take any of it I don't think you can, to you know to readers and editors. I think you can't. It's, I mean, you can pick and choose. It's your taste. But I think that for people to get angry or to people, especially when they're reading a genre book uh, that uh, is you know darker material, I think people need to realize it's you know part of the package. You're going to read some dark stuff, um, and it's stuff that makes you uncomfortable. But and it was certainly not gratuitous. But it was yeah. Even if it's inferred, people will they freak right. out. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be horrified, but I want to be horrified by stuff that I have decided I'm okay with. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> pretty much the, 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 the one thing about, um, you know, um, Strange is the Night that uh, the reviewers stopped at was the, the sexual... Uh, abuse you know part of it and that was something that i just thought was part of the whole package i thought you know this guy this character is a jerk and clearly he's a jerk and he treats everyone badly and he trashes people and the ingenues who come to you know try to get him to review their shows well of course he tries to take advantage of them of course he tries to take advantage of everybody because he's a jerk um, but, you know, that was the one thing that stopped the people who were reviewing it. And they just, and, you know, immediately they turned against the character. Immediately they, they hated the character. Up to that point, they thought, you know, that he was, he was being treated rather severely. But then they wanted him to die. And so it is very tricky. And sometimes it surprises me. Are you surprised sometimes, Gwendolyn, by things that people zero in on in your work and, and you wonder, you know, okay, well, I'm try I, I am aware and I'm being sensitive, but at the same time, I'm a fiction writer and I have to go where my story is going to go. So how do you, you know, do you, do you ask yourself those questions or do you just, you know, commit to the story and go? I, I very much ask myself those questions. Those are always things. I mean, in particular, I always want to be very sensitive on any topics that could that could hurt someone. Anything that, you know, that does need a trigger warning or that would have a trigger warning before it, even if maybe the publication won't include one. I always think I, I want to be very, very respectful and mindful of that. So I do think that. But I also know what you're saying as well, and especially with, with the Tower Princesses, I thought there's no other way to tell the story. This this story, that's what this is about. This is about this is about the culture that wants to protect women. But if something happens to a woman, then it's like, oh we have to, you know and, and this is victim blaming in general. It's not just yeah, I was about to say and it's not just about that. It's about blaming them when it happens. Absolutely. And victim blaming broadly. I mean, we blame everybody for everything. If you get sick, people will blame you for getting sick. You know, everything, uh, you know, broadly. And obviously this is specifically the, that story specifically about rape culture, but there's so much victim blaming in society and that's such it's such a huge problem of, of wanting to turn against somebody just because something bad happened to them. And so that's something that, that I very much wanted very to do in that story. It's so funny. And it's so, it's so, it's so superstitious, really. Do you know how people will take a huge step back from someone who is already going through something really hard? Yeah. Um, yeah. As, almost as if, you know, somehow by association, something negative will then exactly. get on you. <laughs> Can I just talk exactly. about this? Because it kind of gets into what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I take care of cancer patients. And actually, one of the best books I ever read about how does a patient with cancer feel once they're diagnosed is the metamorphosis. One night, they were suddenly transformed into an enormous vermin. And that's how the world treats them now. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
another story that I really enjoyed, Gwen, was um, the man in the Ambry. And I would really love it if you spent a few minutes talking about that. I know you you included that quote today whenever on Facebook yes. there was a quote from that that you included as you were promoting this. I'm like, oh, you must like that one. That that's that's like my family's favorite story I've I've ever written. And that's yeah. I love that well, one. Well before you start, um, let me if I can find it in the book real quick, let me read that quote because <laughs> for those that didn't see it on, on Facebook, uh let's see, page seventy five. Uh, maybe I can't find it real quick. Well, yeah, here it is. Sorry about that. Uh, sometimes I've wondered if maybe I wasn't meant for this world. Maybe my job was to taste stars, but everyone got me off track. So, <laughs> had to read that. And that, that, that goes back to something she says earlier in the, in the story. I think in the first letter, she's when she writes to the man in the Embry saying that she told people that she could taste stars, but then people got upset with her and then she didn't say it anymore because, right. you know, she didn't want to upset people, but it didn't make it any less true. And so, so that story really just started with, with like the line, dear man in the Embry, I know you're there. And it was just that simple. And I'm like, okay, you know, what is this creature and who is this person who's talking to him? So it went from there and it very much ended up being the story about this girl who does feel like an outsider and feels very, very alone talking to this creature who basically like lives sort of like a monster in the closet kind of deal. Um, but an Ambry, because I thought that sounded cool. I actually didn't even know what an Ambry was until I started writing this. And a lot of times it's more like a cabinet, but it can be like a closet. So that's what it is in this story. And, um, so really just exploring that relationship of, of this creature that, that, that is living separately from human beings, obviously, and this girl that feels the same way and sort of like seeing how the two of them and how she grows up and how much she connect, both connects and disconnects from this, this monster and, you know, from, from herself and, and where she's, where she's going. So. Uh, and was the, I'm assuming so, but you know, Maybe I'm assuming something that that isn't correct. Uh, all the red apples have withered to gray. Kind of a sleeping, dark Sleeping Beauty story. Yes, yeah, Sleeping Beauty and, and Snow White. I think it's technically yes. closer to Snow White, but I always think Sleeping Beauty too, even though I it's I think closer to Snow White, right? Because of the, the apples. But I always think of all the sleeping people as being so close to Sleeping Beauty and, and how they all, yeah. So that one was very much, uh, that also started with an image of like an apple after, um, uh, you know, what happened to the apples, you know, in Snow White after after she, she took that bite. And I sort of wanted to explore like where the orchard, that these poison apples came from. So that, that was that was where that, that one came from. You have a question, Philip? Well, yeah, you mentioned earlier the inspiration of um, Eraserhead and it got me wondering, and Mike's been talking about some of your books having fairy tale elements. So it got me wondering about, um, uh, I know you mentioned a couple inspirations, but are there any other films or filmmakers who you draw on for visuals when you're when you're writing? Um, you know, that's kind of I'm very curious to know if I like it. If I I always find it interesting when people draw from other mediums and incorporate it into their their prose. Um, so I'm curious to know if there's anyone in there you you pinpoint. Obviously, David Lynch. I think for a long time, whenever I was younger, I drew a lot from from some of Tim Burton's stuff. And then going with other mediums, I've always loved Charles Adams and Edward Gorey. So that that's obviously art, not film. But I, I always, I always loved, I always loved their work. I'm trying to think who else I would say in terms of I know, I know there are other filmmakers that I draw from, but definitely David Lynch. I think a lot about just the strange worlds and, and like the small towns that you really can't quite trust, even though they look initially like you can trust them, but then ultimately it's like, there's always something more going on beyond, beneath the surface with, with his world. So. Um, so you're gonna be a panelist at Necronomicon, right? What panels are you on? I am on a fairy Tale, uh, fairy tale panel and a Shirley Jackson panel, which I'm, I'm very excited about. I'm excited about all three of them, but Shirley Jackson is, is, you know, one of the ones that I've really delved into a lot more recently, like I said, the last few years. And then a Mary Shelley one. So that's really exciting. So I'm very, very eager with all three of those. So. Awesome. Have you been to Necronomicon before? 
I have not. I've wanted to go, and this is the first year I was able to. And then I have to give a shout out to Farah Rose Smith, who hopefully is watching this right now, because um, I was just talking to her one day, and I, I was saying, "Oh, you know, I'm hoping to go to Necronomicon," and she's one of the volunteers. She's like, "Well, if you want, if you want to, I might be able to, you know, get you on a panel." And so that's a big shout out to her for for very much helping helping me out with that. So I very much appreciate it because I I was just going to come just 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 as a as just coming and looking around and everything because I'm really excited. So being on a panel just makes it really, really an honor. This is such a great convention. I know like all of oh, you yeah. guys go, right? So I, I'm like a newbie. I'm a total newbie. <laughs> It'll be my first one as well. Okay. I'll be there. Uh, I'm on a panel. I believe my panel takes place in the bar. <laughs> right, around, <laughs> right around four o'clock, depending on, depending on how things are going. Well, that's about uh, right. So come find me, and I'll be talking about I'll be talking about uh, whatever whatever the muse whispers to me. Hey, Gwendolyn, I'm always curious about the writer's process. Um, do you do you set aside some time every single day to write? How do you deal with writer's block? That kind of stuff. I usually deal with writer's block by like banging my head against a desk. That's usually how I deal with that. Not very well is the answer on that one to be entirely or spilling honest. or spilling something into your webcam, right? That I heard that story. What? So, oh yes, that's yeah, right. Or spilling something into the webcam. Oh yes. So <laughs> I'm using an external webcam today because I was working on a project one day and actually spilled coffee all over my computer and I thought it only affected my my keyboard, but my webcam's dead now too. So and that was actually a stressful day where I had writer's block. So that's how I deal with it by by spilling coffee everywhere and, and getting angry. <laughs> I do actually try when I do have writer's block is is trying to go to like film or art or some other medium a lot of times like like we were just talking about because I find that helpful to try to get away from prose right away like that way it's like okay I can't I can't do fiction right now let's go try something else and so that that helps me after I'm done spilling stuff all over my keyboard <laughs> um I don't always write every day, though I do write most days, mostly in the evening. I'm more of like an evening writer. I always admire people who can write first thing in the morning. I think that's so great. Like people are like, I get up and I write first thing. That's not me at all. I'm like, I, I need my coffee that I will hopefully not spill anywhere. And um, so that's, that's, you know, I do try to write every day, but I don't like punish myself or get angry if I don't write every day because I feel like that can almost be like you're shackled to it at that point. So, yeah. so that's, yeah. I try not to do word counts. That always freaks me out. Word counts because if I don't hit the word count, then I then I, I I get disappointed. So I just like okay, as long as I get something done today or tomorrow, I will be happy. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to set yourself up to fail. In other words. Yes, exactly, exactly. Rick, uh, you have a question yeah. for Gwen. Since you wrote a story about hating your older sister, do do you have an older sister? I don't actually. I'm an only child. <laughs> But I write a lot about sisters, so I always think that that's like really interesting. Like, I don't know, was I meant to have a sister, or was you know, is there something like in my psyche that feels like I should have had siblings? I, I don't know, but I don't. I don't have any siblings, so I definitely, yeah, I have an older cousin that I was really close to, though. So I think some of that might be based on on her. So maybe you have a sister, but she's turned into something else. There, there we go. go. Yep. 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 <laughs> I like Look that. outside. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Since you were into Shirley Jackson, most of us only read The Lottery and The and, uh, Haunting of Hill House. What stories would you recommend? I love We Have Always Lived in the Castle. That's that's my favorite. So I, that's that's I think her last novel, and I I absolutely love that one. And then for the short stories, I really love Pillar of Salt and Louisa. Please come home. I love those those two short stories that aren't aren't always talked about as much as the lottery, but I think that they're really just strange and and really really got under my skin. So now, since you mentioned David Lynch, Kelly and I are Twin Peaks fans. Are you watching the current revival? <sighs> yeah, I'm not super crazy <laughs> about it so far. Like, I'm trying. I'm sticking with it. I've got my little log lady back here. I don't know if you can see her. Like, there she is. My little log lady sitting behind me. Oh, that's <laughs> a log lady. <laughs> oh, wow. But yeah. I, 
I'm willing to see where it goes because, you know, David Lynch has always an interesting vision, but so far I'm like, I don't like it quite as much as the original. It's so. kind of like when you're finally getting into it, it'll bring on somebody who's scratching itches in the bar and you're wondering what the heck does this have to do with the main plot? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. It sounds like you're kind of on our wavelength, too. It's it's a frustrating season. That's, that's, yeah, that's exactly. That's a great, great, very pithy way of describing it. It's frustrating. So, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm still hopeful that by the end, it'll be, it'll be at least a little bit better, or at least be worth all that, all those very small moments of, yes, you know, sweeping up peanut shells. <laughs> well, we're well, there with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan of the original show. Um, big fan, but I couldn't get personally. I could not get past the first episode of the revival. So, you know, yeah. my wife and I were looking at each other like, each other like, what? No, no. Yeah, we got we got through two two episodes, and then they're just sort of, mm, do you want to watch the next one? Mm. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to push ourselves to watch the rest. So. Yeah, SP, you, you quit when it actually started getting good. But then after episode four, it gets bad again. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hate a tease like that. I I, I don't know. I don't want to commit. <laughs> You're wearing a very lovely necklace. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's like a little uh, bird skulls. <laughs> well, I was at, well, as those are bird skulls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, a common question that I get from people is what. What, what are the books behind you? And what, what were the books behind your guest? So you want to touch on that briefly? What, what you got back there? <laughs> All right. Um, I have like a scary stories, a treasury. I think you asked me about this one the other day. It's Footsteps in the Fog. This is right. Alpha, San Francisco. Uh, True Grit, which isn't necessarily like horror at all, but I, I like that one. Ray Bradbury, The Illustrated Man. I've got some uh, Jane Austen. So it's like a whole like uh, wide variety of, of genres. Eclectic, yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I also have my own. I actually have my own books back there too, which is probably, you know, a little much for an interview, but it's back there. Next to Log Lady. She's overseeing so my book. So. <laughs> you, like me, are really into Halloween. I want to talk about Halloween for yes. a bit. So yes. how, did, how, did, how did you first realized that this was the holiday for you. <laughs> it, that's all on my parents. They got married on Halloween. And they like got married on the Halloween like back in the early 80s when it wasn't as popular as it is now. Back in the day, I, you know, back in the day, I don't think people did it as much as they do now. So like I always grew up, they, they've always loved Halloween. It's always been a big deal in, 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 uh, in our house. So yeah. <laughs> and you're from Pennsylvania, right? It gets cold there, I'm assuming. And I live in Pennsylvania now. I'm from Ohio. I always oh, think it's funny Ohio. in my bio. I'm always like, so I'm a state of, of Ohio. So 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 you love Halloween, but you live in the far country, so no little kids come up to your door that you can snatch and toss in the oven. No. <laughs> It's sad. That's that's a really sad thing about about living in the country. We get zero trick or treaters, and that that's sad. That's actually one of the things I really miss about living more in in town. But my dad does a whole big display at their house in Ohio, so it's like I just go over there. So. <laughs> you come out on your favorite time of year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I'm not a big summer person. I know a lot of people love summer and I'm just like, oh, it's so hot. I just can't wait for fall to come. I love fall. So yeah, oh, definitely my favorite. I'm right with you <laughs> on that. So talk about your house for a minute and your bio. You said you, you basically say it's haunted. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's not nearly as haunted as I want it to. Oh, okay. Uh, we it's it's an old farmhouse it's on like 30 acres of land most of which is just like still very wild like most of it we've just let you know stay wild let all the trees go so it's it's an interesting area it's a very interesting area it's definitely an area when you if you find a circle of mushrooms you don't step in the middle of it like i'm, I'm not getting involved in that like that we just leave those alone around here <laughs> hey uh who are some of your uh, who are some of your favorite contemporary writers, writers working today? Ooh, ooh. Pretty much all of you. I mean, you guys are all great. I mean, on this show, I know that sounds just, you know, like I, but seriously, you guys are all fantastic. Um, let's see, who else? 
Oh, there's so many. Um, one of my really good friends, Brooke Wara, is just really getting started in her career. She's going to be in the new uh, Dim Shores Looming Low anthology that's coming oh, out. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a good one. So I want to give, want to give her a shout out because I feel like she's really at a, at a great place. It's still very much starting out, but you know, I'm, I'm still very much starting out too. I make that sound like it sounds like bad. It's not like I'm very early in my career and she and I sort of like we're in slush piles together at the very start of our, our careers a few years ago. So it's very fun to see people that you're, you sort of started out with in, a, in total obscurity, starting to get publications and in great places like Dim Shores on that anthology. So I want to give her a shout out. Oh my, who else? I've been, I interview lots of people on my, on my blog that I, I just, there's so many of them that I love. I mean, Damien Angelica Walters is, is obviously oh, yeah. a great one. I know you've had her on your show. Um, Oh my, I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah, she's um, great. She had a story in, in uh, a book I edited and it was just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Emily B. Catanio. I actually just had the had a really great experience um, collaborating with her. She's been published in like the dark. She's going to have something out in Nightmare soon. So she's a really great one. So she's a really great author that I really admire her work. Oh, yeah. I feel like you put me on the spot more with this oh, one yeah, than that, any of them. Okay. I feel like I'm going to leave somebody out. <laughs> you don't have to keep going. I did kind of put you on the spot. You know, speaking, speaking, of, speaking of slush piles, you, didn't you just judge uh, a short, short fiction contest? Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. It was for it was a uh, slash fiction. Men. Yes, it was actually microfiction, so they all had to be 250 words or less, and um, so that was really fun, and it was like on the theme of home, it was like magic realism, but a lot of them had like, they had some very nice dark fantasy elements, a lot of the story, so that was very much right up right up my alley, and uh, it was it was funny because I was like, I have to read these blind, I don't want to know who's submitting them because I figured I would know some people, and of course the two, the two winners, Maria Haskins and Catherine Culper, are both people I had interviewed on my blog, and both writers that I very much had and so yeah, so that was that was a really good experience. I'd never judged a contest before. That was a very new thing for me, and that was that was a really really fun experience. So I love Bracken Magazine. That's a great one. There's not a lot of magic realism uh, publications out there that really focus in on that like they do. So that's a that's a really great one. So it was an honor to be able to get to judge that one. I I meant to ask you when we were talking about Halloween and autumn, and I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't if you don't if none come to mind, that's fine. But do you have any favorite Halloween slash autumn, you know, horror movies, horror, uh, m favorite Halloween books, favorite Halloween movies, that type of thing? Favorite Halloween books is easy. It's got to be The October Country by Ray Bradbury. Oh, yeah. I, I love I love The October Country. I feel like, you know, every time I feel down about writing, that's another one. That's actually one that even if I'm like, I need a break from writing, I can still go back to The October Country and be like, okay, this is why I write because I want I want to somehow come anywhere close to, to this someday. And I that, that's like a goal. I love that one. That one's really great. Don't you just love that phrase right at the beginning of the book? That, that country where it is always turning late in the year. That yes, one. yes, yes. That, that really sums it up. <laughs> it does. It, yeah. Any that, other? That's, that's, that's probably the biggest one. I'm trying to think of, of any other ones, like any movies that I watch. Probably just Halloween. We always watch Halloween at Halloween. That's so on the nose, though. I should have a better answer than that. <laughs> no, I think John think. Carpenter. No, I don't, that's, that's fine. I, a friend of mine, Scott Thomas, is really into Halloween uh, like I am, and he... That, that's his number one movie that he names too. You know, he watches it every yeah. year. So John Carpenter yeah. did a great watch, job, you know, with it. I always watch Carrie. I tend to watch Carrie. I actually like watching Carrie almost more in the spring though, because it's a prom movie. So that almost seems more like a spring movie than a Halloween movie. But I think I watch it both times of year. So, nice. <laughs> so that's a good one. <laughs> Does anyone, do, do any of you have any more questions for Gwen? Uh, the, Name of the book again is uh, her collection is and her smile will untether the universe. I did link to it to the Amazon page in the podcast summary, and you could also go to Journal Stone's website and buy it direct from them, I believe. So um, definitely pick it up. It's it's really worth a read. I really enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, I don't when I when I'm highlighting in a book, I really like it. So. <laughs> Well, thank I, you. Thank you so I have two, much. two real quick questions that are sure. that are that are. One is what is, what is your blog site? 
Which, oh. How do you get to the blog that you mentioned? I. Uh, you can get to it just from my regular website, such so as GwendolynKeist.com. So it's just right on there. Yep. And Keist is K I K I S T E. So yes. for, don't know. And then, uh, Let's I was going to. Gonna, I'm sorry, Matthew. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matthew. It's linked to the web page. Uh, her website is. Okay. So look on the easy page. It's there. And then I was going to ask. Aside from the novel you mentioned, uh, what do you have anything else coming out um, in the near future that people can? Pick up any stories, any anthologies. I think you mentioned an anthology, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, um, I have several. I have several uh, short stories coming out over the course of the next year. I don't know um, if any of those have been announced yet. I have a novella coming out, but again, I'm not sure where we are with announcing that yet. So I don't want to announce it quite yet. But I, we're definitely moving along on that. So we even got a, a cover and everything. So that that I'll definitely be formally announcing soon, and then. Hopefully something, like I said, I collaborated on a novelette with Emily B. Catania, so hopefully we'll have an announcement about that soon. So a lot of things sort of in progress, but nothing other than the novel to formally uh, announce right now. So, yeah. Well, great. Gwen, thanks so much for being on the show. I've really enjoyed talking Thank with you. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, if you want to exit, all you got to do is close your browser. It'll kick you right out. All or right, you can, or good. you can stay if you want to. We're we're going to talk about Joe Pulver, so. Yay! So as I said before, it's it's kind of serious with Joe. I thought it would be nice for us to talk about maybe some of our favorite Joe Pulver stories. Talk about that for a minute. Rick, you want to start? Or Matt? I think Matt has one too. Either one. Well, I'm terrible about this because I don't remember the title of it. Um, it's so striking to me when I read it, and I, I've gone back and I've reread it a couple times. And I don't remember, so I just feel bad about this. So someone may have to chime no, in. What, what? I have the plot again. Okay, it is. It's, the, the story is this guy is driving a car across country. He's a kind of a low life loser, you know. Does uh, a petty crook, maybe uh, a petty thug. He's got something in the trunk of his car. And he had to do bad things to get it there, and he's being paid a very large amount of money in cash when he gets to the person who's receiving this item. And he's mainly just thinking about, at first, what he's going to do with the money, and then he starts wondering about the thing in the trunk of the car, and maybe he shouldn't have done all this. And then when he gets there, it was just a pretext to get him there. It was not, and, and, and some bad things are going to happen to him. And you never find out what was in the trunk of the car. Um, and Joe always said it was just a classic MacGuffin. Right. The guy's internal dialogue was really compelling. Does that really Well, if anybody knows anybody? what story that is, uh, email me. Or if you're watching live, put it in the chat room. Lovecraft at gmail.com. Yeah, cat, my cat's watching, so. <laughs> she says, cat says, Matt, that's fine. Joe barely remembers the titles as well. So, well, I just feel so bad. she's saying, don't feel bad. <laughs> SP, you've got one? I have one. Uh, it's in this book, The Children of Old Leech, and it is called The Last Crossroads on a Calendar of Yesterdays. And um, I don't want to give away too much of it. It's a, it's a very compelling story. It was one of my favorite stories in the anthology. And... Um, I think that what's so uh, scary and crazy good about it is that the dreaded enemy, the alien, the invader, is um, uh, white people. <laughs> the, there's, a, there's a sort of Aryan compound, there's a group of white nationalists who um, are become the the focus of uh, the central characters um you know disturbance and rage and um it's very very compelling and that's all i want to say about it because you should read it um if right. if you don't have the anthology you should and that is one of my favorite stories in it so it, it also ties into what the mac is the mac people mm -hmm. So that's why he chose them. My, my favorite is uh, All My Injuries, which is his sequel to The Cast of a Manolato by Edgar Allan Poe. 
where he makes the uh, two protagonists of that story worshippers of Nihilothotep. And that whole walling up in uh, the basement had to do with a feud in the cult or or a sort of uh, theological feud about how to worship Nihilothotep properly. Um, I've got a favorite that I can't really talk about. I hopefully I won't get in trouble from Joe for giving away the the title, but it's something that he just wrote. I think I'm the only person to have read it, which is a privilege. Uh, it's called a long, dark, grim road. Uh, it's a novelette, I believe. Don't I don't remember exactly what the word count is. He told me, but um, it's very very good. And you know, Joe and Cat aren't going to be able to go to Necronomicon because of Joe's uh, health issue here. So I kind of feel bad for him. I hope that he recovers um, and everything works out fine. So I was going to mention the Dim Shores book. Yeah. That that Sam's doing. I don't remember the title, but the one. Looming Low. No, no. The I'm sorry. I meant the one that he's doing with Joe to raise oh. money for Joe. Have you heard about yeah, I don't remember the title either. Book that Joe, I think, and Edward Morris co-wrote. Yeah, Edward Morris. Yeah, and they're re- and um, they're going to make it available to buy. I think Sam said in the next few weeks, or he's trying to get it ready for I think for Necronomicon. But um, and then I guess you can all the proceeds from the chapbook sales are going to go toward the hospital bills. That's good. Via Dim Shores, I'm sure if you go to dimshores.com, uh, you can or, or their Facebook page. That's where he announced it. Um, my favorite Joe Pulver story is Hunger. I haven't read a lot. I've read, I think I've read four Joe stories, but I like. Um, I think it's Hungry Rats or Hunger, Hungry Rats. It's in a it's in the a Mountain Walk uh, anthology that St. Joshi did. But that's a very dark, very gruesome, very fun story. I loved it. <laughs> A sequel to the Rats and the Rats and the I don't think. I don't think so. I think it's a sequel to. I mean, I mean, it's it's definitely the Rats and the Walls are referred to. But has it, to be it, it, it sort of spreads. It's not really a direct sequel, but it's sort of. Yeah, I don't know if the Baron is in the mythology. That, I mean, it's it's got the it's got the same family involved. It's like oh, a, it does, the Baron is the same family as. Yeah, it, it's like a modern take on Rats and the Walls. Yeah, it's very it's very grim. SP, very did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to i I just want to say I am eternally grateful to Joe. Um, he's just he's just such a generous and wonderful writer and editor, and the people that he has rounded up to be in the anthologies he's edited, such so just great talented people and people you wouldn't necessarily think of you know all kind of mixed together and joe has a way of talking to people about the themes of these anthologies in such a passionate way that he really brings out the best in you you know even if it's not a theme that you would have thought of yourself i i read um chambers robert chambers because joe uh, was doing an anthology and he said are you familiar with this work and I'm like mm, vaguely from years ago but I don't so I read it closely and carefully and and strange as the night is a story I would not ne- would not have you know ended up with I would not have you know found direction for that story um, and shaped it the way that I did uh, except that he was so passionate about it and I think the story I wrote for him for um, the madness of Dr. Caligari is probably one, probably the best story I've written, and um, it only exists because Joe invited me to be part of that project that he cared about so passionately. So he is an awesome writer, but he's a great editor and uh, really generous and wonderful and supportive editor and writer. So thanks, Joe. Yeah, and I yeah think whether he. Oh, sorry, he, um, I was just going to say whether he's editing or writing, he's very passionate about what he's doing. So and and definitely generous. I mean, when we started Strange Eons, you know, I had a couple of writer friends, and 
Joe was one of the ones I approached and said, hey, I'm doing this. It's kind of a offshoot of Planet Lovecraft, but we want to get fiction in here. And, and would you be interested? He let me just, you know, pick and choose through his stories that he had and, oh, wow. and just pick one. And I picked Orchard Fruit, which was in the first issue of the magazine. But my, uh, <clears throat> my favorite Pulver story is that for uh, Strange Eons issue four, we were going to do a Christmas holiday special. And I told Joe that I had an idea for a story that I'd like him to, to collaborate with me. And it was basically a, um, uh, it's a wonderful life story, only it turns out that it's, it's a devil who comes down and shows this guy that everybody in his life would be much better off if he had never been born. And I had it's not a wonderful up. life. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, the title of it was called But Not For Me. It's a wonderful life, but not for me. Right. And uh, I told Joe the idea, and I said, you know, this is kind of the idea that I'm looking for, you know, and I'd love to write this with you. And like a day later, I get the entire story written out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and awesome and he was just like, you know, here you go. And it was, uh, it was, it was fantastic. It was perfect. And that's just the kind of guy he's always been. He's been a champion for everybody who's starting out in the business. And uh, it's just a, you know, he is a great writer and he is a great person, but he's a huge cheerleader for everybody else who's trying to to do something in this genre. Yeah, I think everybody listening to this knows what good friends I am with Joe Pulver, as we all are. And I'm very worried about him. I hate the fact that I'm not going to get to see him and Kat at Necronomicon. Uh, Kat said that we can say this publicly. I'll just read it. Uh, Joe has brain surgery coming up to remove a cell growth. We're hoping for a non-shocking biopsy result. So, so yeah, it's pretty serious. So the, ple the people who uh, are watching the podcast who – um, if you go to uh, the group, the uh, Lovecraft Easing podcast group on Facebook, um, Lovecraft uh, Easing message board. Right. Mike has listed the site there, the link where you can go uh, to GoFundMe and you can help Joe and you can help Catherine by uh, contributing. And this, it, it, it'll really make a difference it will make a huge difference for them so please contribute if you can and if you can't if you don't have the funds at the moment that you know then try to share the link with your friends and maybe someone else will be able to pitch in so also i've uh, posted links to a lot of his books and whatever you want to buy he'll probably get at least a little bit of return so those are available to you also the GoFundMe link is also in the uh, podcast summary. So whether you're watching it on YouTube or later on on the on iTunes and so forth, you can just click on it from there. Um, you know, I, I guess yeah. this is just – I never met Carl Edward Wagner, and I always so loved his writing and reading about him – through the stories that people remembered, he's such a larger than life figure. And yet he was gone far too soon. And now I think the person I know most like Carl Edward Wagner is Joe Pulver. He has very rarefied tastes, you know, like Carl did, uh, that he has these, this eclectic view of horror and weird fiction and what makes it good. That, that is a very unique spin. He has a very unique way of writing. He's written about many different things, and uh, especially he's been so good to up and coming writers, you know. And uh, even of us who aren't those of us who aren't writers, you know, he'll he's very generous with his time. I just I feel really bad about the whole situation. Yeah, well, hopefully we will find out more in a day or two. Um, as I said, I'm I'm pretty worried about it. I'm sure you guys are too. Um, he was very helpful to me. He was a cheerleader, as you guys said, and helpful to me when I edited Autumn Cthulhu. You know, he gave me a ton of good advice, and I know the book is was was better because of his influence. So, so anyway. Here's Joe Pulver. Um, now, Kelly Young 
performs a great service for the listeners of the show. <laughs> he, he goes to see crappy movies so that you don't have to. So do you want to talk about The Dark Tower? Oh, man. I want to spoil the fuck out of this movie. But first of all, uh, Philip, did you happen to catch this at all yet? No, I'm I'm holding out for VOD. <laughs> I'm a dark tower. I got it, better ways to spend my time and money. I just know that you are a big King fan. I and, am. Uh, I, am and I, is, so. I knew I knew from the first trailer it was a no go. It was a non-star. Right. I really did. I had to be specific, but I did. You have a huge thumbs down. It is a huge thumbs down. It's a it's a frustrating movie because um, there's moments in it that are pretty strong, but it's overall, if you're a fan of the books, um, and I'm going to spoil a little bit here, uh, it it takes elements from all seven books and then elements from Black House, the uh, the uh, collaboration with Peter Straub, and it it jams it all into 95 minutes, and Roland completes his quest at the end of this film. There is, uh, there is no doubt that, that, and that came as a, a, a shock to me because I thought we were at least going to be looking at a sequel or something. No, it is, it is self-contained in 95 minutes and you are out. Um, but there's a TV show happening. Uh, the, I would be shocked if there was a TV show. He was, he was signed on to do a TV. Yes, but I'm going to guess this dismal opening weekend will kill that. Um, and probably kill any chance of this being, you know, adapted anytime soon again. Um, what, what they should have done was was looked at each book and said, you know, let's figure this out. The Gunslinger is a post-apocalyptic spaghetti western. Let's make that movie. Uh, the Drawing of the Three feels a lot like Terminator to me. Let's make that movie. Um, so they should have done that. Instead, it's a... A mishmash of all of these things and none of these things and Idris Elba who is arguably the only reason to go see this film is only so-so in it uh, Matthew McConaughey does the best he can with the dialogue he's given the boy Jake uh, the kid who's playing him is by far the best actor in this and maybe the best child actor I've seen in a long long time he's amazing but it really turns him into the hero of the movie and the whole thing feels like a young adult version of really? the Dark Tower yeah with huh. with a Marvel superhero ending so <laughs> I don't understand why they would take so much content I mean, literally, you could make 10 seasons of television from yeah. those seven books and cram it into a stupid movie. Why wouldn't you just do exactly – I mean, we, there are so many success stories to look at with everything from Game of Thrones. To, you know, I mean, all those TV series yeah, that are so successful. Are that's, that's why cool. would you not just say, forget the movie? Who cares about movies anyway anymore? And let's right. just, let's just cre let's create a seven-series arc for this character and really get into the, I mean, you, I mean, there's so much material that'd be so much fun. And, uh, and I mean, you take, and I don't know, it just, it staggers me that they would blow it on such a lame swing of the bat. And you're throwing seven series out as if they could do a, a season for each book, but some of those books would be three seasons, you know, they get pretty Easily. hefty towards the end there. So yeah, there. You know, I'd like to say this was a cash grab, and that's all it was. It was a quick cash grab with no no thought of what might happen afterwards and how this will kill any chance of this being done correctly. Uh, it it was just it was just a real bummer. Um, there's all sorts of tiny little things in the film that are uh, nods to other things in the books, but they're just visual tags so that if you've read the books you can go oh that's what they're referencing there but that just becomes more frustrating that whoever you know the guy who wrote the screenplay is the guy who wrote batman and robin and uh oh man batman forever and insurgents and you know a lot of you know let's face it really bad movies um so he he got paid you know a couple million to write this script and then he washed his hands of it and said i'm out and let everybody else deal with it so I would say uh, if you're a fan of Stephen King, 
that you're going to be disappointed in this film, which is a shock because Hollywood has always been so good to Stephen King adaptations. That uh, you know he's not having a good he's not having a uh, yeah he's not having a good year though for for film well, and TV. King is having a great year because he gets paid for all of this shit. Well, yeah, but I mean, The Mist I, I, was terrible. I mean, I was say, like, yeah. Dark Tower is terrible. You can have a step up from the movie to the TV show like in The Mist. Yeah, exactly. When I'm does, very I'm very curious to see how Castle what Castle Rock ends up being. Yeah. Yeah. The Castle Rock TV series, which I when heard does that, When does that come out and when does uh it come out? It comes out pretty soon. That could be. That's going to be a winner. I have a feeling that's going to be a big win for King. I hope so. Uh, I mean, it looks great. It just looks great. I mean, I'm so excited to see that movie. And they've already they've already greenlit the sequel, or the part, the companion, I should say, movie, which I think bodes really well for the quality of the first film because they would not greenlight it before releasing it if um, if they were concerned about. And not doing well, so uh, I'm excited to see, it. and I'm excited to see Castle Rock. I don't know when Castle Rock's coming out. I know it's, I think it's later this year. I uh, know it's Hulu, I think, but I also know that they signed um, the actor who plays Pennywise in the film. It, he's signed on to be in the series as well. So Pennywise will be, and it'll be the Pennywise from the movie. It won't be a different Pennywise. That was recently announced. It would be neat if they could if they could put together a cinematic universe, a Stephen King cinematic universe, where you know actors played the same characters and and cross platforms. Um, I don't know. You know, obviously I was being a bit facetious. Hollywood has shit on Stephen King for years now, and uh, and he gets paid I'm, every time. Sure. I'm not sure why I was hoping for something different. We, you know, we knew that, that when they cast Idris Elba, that this was going to be a little different. They, they cast a black man in uh, King's white person role, which bothered a lot of people, but m meant something really different if you've read the books, because a later character shows up, a black woman who has a real problem with Roland because he's a white man. And as soon as Idris Elba was cast, you were like, mm, okay, they're not looking forward at all because this, right. this other character is not going to, is not going to matter anymore. Sony is not known for their great movies. They're not, they're not, yeah. they're not a home run. They, they, they get one out of a hundred, right? But, um, and, uh, but, but if I've learned anything from Sony over the last decade is, they're happy just to reboot the thing in like two or three years. They don't care. Um, they'll pretend it never happened. You know, that's why they have like 24 Spider-Mans. They just keep throwing it out there oh, making, yeah. making money. I, well, I sure also do, because I think, I, think I think it's worth giving a second look at. It, you know, we've certainly got the technology to make the Dark Tower books if we want to. If anything, we should be changing you know, the last two books, but not the first five. Those were all pretty solid. Well, speaking of Stephen King, talk about Grandma being on Netflix for a second, Kelly. Didn't the podcast listener bring this to your attention? I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. Yeah, I think it was James Franklin. James, I hope that I am remembering your name correctly. Um, he had listened to our Patreon podcast of um, of Dagon. Yeah. And then had you know brought up a couple of points to me about it. And then mentioned that on your list of Lovecraftian movies, that you had left off Mercy, which is streaming free on Netflix, and it is a uh, rather loose adaptation of Grandma, the Stephen King story from Skeleton Crew, I believe. And that had been adapted also in, I believe, the the mid '80s Twilight Zone series, or maybe it was the Outer Limits. I think it was adapted better in the Outer Limits episode. It, it was the twi Twilight Zone. It, it was Twilight Zone? Okay. Um, but this has the kid from uh, The Walking Dead, Chandler Riggs, in it. And um, it's, got a, it's got a rather large tie to, uh, I believe, Hester yes. in it. So, so I don't know. Has anybody else seen Mercy? 
I watched it when it first came out, and I remember kind of mm, not caring for it too much, but I might have to give it a second look now. I have to take a look at it. But uh, it's sort of, I mean, the, the grandma's story is sort of Stephen King's version of the thing of a doorstep. Yes. Yeah, and that that is, uh, that storyline does play through the film also. Well, you mentioned the, the Patreon podcast where we talked about Dagon. Uh, we do have Patreon only podcasts if you're interested. Here's an, I wanted to read a nice letter from one of the Patreons. Amazed at the wealth of goodies already. I live in LA um, and have a 45 minute commute each way. And your podcast has made that commute much easier. In, in addition to increasing my Netflix queue and to read stack. Proud to support the show, which always feels like sitting down with a bunch of old friends and Kelly and shooting the breeze. Son Thanks for the bitch. great show, Bill. <laughs> Wait a second, 45-minute commute? You mean he works four miles away from his home? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Maybe what he means is just we're all old friends, Kelly, and you're young. Oh, shit, I'll take that. All right, never mind. <laughs> sure he's just giving Kelly shit, which is he should. So. Right, certainly. Um, SP, would you real briefly talk about uh, uh, your book? I wish I was like you. Um, sure. <laughs> it's out. It's out now, right? It's out now, right? It's out now. I have a copy of it here. It looks like this. My copy and, is downstairs. Uh, where I would show it. Okay. And um, it's from, it's published by Journal Stone. Gwendolyn and I share a publisher. And um, it's, uh, it's about, well, it's set in early 1990s Seattle. And it's, that's when it starts. And um, it's really the story of a vengeful ghost, a vengeful spirit, uh, sort of wandering through a landscape that's not, you know, that's definitely not heaven. It's not quite um, recognizable, um, except that it's the same city where she was stuck before. It's a kind of an existential ghost story. Um, and um, it's dark, and I think it's funny. People have said that it's funny. And we got a, a Publishers Weekly starred review and a uh, very favorable review in This Is Horror. And um, I think there's, well, there are a couple of other reviews coming out, but I can't really, I can't talk about them. So um, I hope people are enjoying it. It's dark, it's weird, and it's not quite like the other books that I've uh, had published. Um, it's, it's definitely not a Southern Gothic, um, but it's, I hope it's fun. I hope it's fun to read. Um, I'm, I'm reading it right now. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, oh, sorry, Mike. No, go ahead, Kelly. It's fine. Oh, I, I'm reading it right now, and I'm really loving it. And SP, remind me, I don't have my copy here. Remind me the name of the um, the teacher. teacher. Who is oh, teaching her. <laughs> Lee Todd Butcher. Lee, Lee Todd, Todd Butcher. Butcher. He's a mentor. He's a he's a crime fiction writer who has hit the skids, and he taught a class on crime fiction. And the uh, the the central character, the protagonist, took the class because she was bored and couldn't think of anything else to do. And she sort of uh, spends a lot of time trying to uh, outshine the teacher or get even with him. Uh, she has a relationship with him. Anyway, so I, Lee Todd I, Butcher. I, I knew that I Lee knew Todd that Butcher was not based on me, but uh, I very much identified with him since I taught some screenwriting classes and stuff. And, and I was just like, this guy is my new hero. He's so. a bitter man. He's a bitter, bitter man. Um, he, he was successful. He had some books on the New York Times bestseller list, but uh, he, it's been a long time since he's written a novel, and he ended up teaching this crime fiction class at a community college just to make ends meet. And I've, I've known guys like this. I've known, known uh, 
creative writing teachers who just kind of ended up where they were and didn't want to be there and hated the students and told them all that their writing was crap. And, you know, uh, so he's, he's kind of a composite of, of all of those guys, uh, everybody I've ever met who stood in front of a class and said, you're garbage. You're all garbage. I was going <laughs> to say, know what you're doing. You're 19. What could you know? So. I was going to say, not only do you know people like that, you're on a podcast with one of them. <laughs> 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 well, I'm I'm very pleased to know that you identify with Lee Todd. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Probably not your intention, but uh, that's how it worked out. <laughs> um, if you want to be a Patreon, uh, Lovecraft Easing Patreon, I've got the link in the podcast summary. So you know you can get a lot, awful lot of content, extra content for for five bucks a month. It's not too much. Um. I'm reading a book right now I wanted to recommend. I'm halfway through it, and I'm going to have the author on on the show later on in the year. But I picked it up at Barnes & Noble, and it's called A God in the Shed. And it struck me as kind of Lovecraftian. And in fact, he opens up with a, a Lovecraft quote. Uh, a God in the Shed by J.F. DeBow. Hopefully I'm saying his last name correctly. But I'm sure if you Google a God in the Shed, you'll you'll find it. So check that out. I just won a copy of that book. I, there was like a contest. Seriously? Yeah, there was a contest running on that they were promoting through Facebook, and it was like if you go to the website and you you know sign up for the newsletter, you know you'll win one of ten copies or whatever. And they just emailed me like two days ago. And they're like, hey, you want a copy of the God in the Shed? But we don't have your your address and it comes through. So I sent my address. I but yeah, so I'm excited. I'll, I'll be excited to check it out when it when it arrives. I hope it'll be signed. They didn't say whether it'd be signed or not. A boy can hope. So that's a God in the Shed. SP's book is I Wish I Was Like You. And SP and, has a short story collection coming out too soon. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Trepidatio, which is an imprint of Journal Stone, will be bringing out um, my short story collection in October, and it's called Strange is the Night. And I think you can pre-order it from the, the publisher's website. So you can buy Gwendolyn's book uh, if you go to the Journal Stone site, and you can buy my novel and pre-order the collection if you are so inclined. Yeah, and again, Gwen's book is titled and her smile will untether the universe, and I highly recommend it. So any, do we need to talk about anything else? Uh, Necronomicon is in a week and a half. I will Kelly's, do my very Kelly's best. Either, right? to, I'll next do my very month? best to, uh, hang on. I will do my very best to bring Necronomicon to anybody who's a follower of Lovecraft Easing as much as I can, you know, with some video and pictures on the Lovecraft Easing page which is facebook.com slash Lovecraft Z-I-N-E, with basically Lovecraft Easing without the E. So I'm sorry, what were you guys saying? So are, you, are we meeting next week? Do we have a guest? Do we have a guest? We do have a guest. Um, I don't remember who it is. Let me look it up. But were you going to say something, Philip? I was only going to say um, I'm looking forward to seeing Kelly. I don't know you. Why, why are you such a dick? I'm we're not going to be in that economic He's going to buy me a drink, he said. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. A anyway. It would we suck to have to miss out on that. Maybe we could talk about Necronomicon at the last half of next week's show. What we're going to do. Yeah. Forward to. Yeah, that's a good idea. And with any luck, I, I know Niels is really busy right now, but with any luck, maybe we can get him on for a few minutes. Super. So. I do have a guest next week. Uh, Glenn Winkleman is his name. Uh, he created a Lovecraftian video game, and I just wanted to talk to him for a few minutes about it, and then we can talk about Necronomicon. Old man Winkleman's boy, yeah. Excuse me? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Sometimes I crack myself up. It sounded kinky. I'm glad somebody's laughing at your jokes, even if it's just you. <laughs> All right. Okay, All right. Kelly, I see the Lee Todd now. I, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, now he's just playing up to it. He's being even a bigger jerk than normal. I re can, I, can I recommend a couple books I've read recently real quick? Sure. I just because I thought really enjoyed them. I've, read, I've, I've plowed through about 10 books in the last few weeks, but um, 
I too really stood out. Uh, Into the Valley of the Sun by Andy Davidson was great. I highly recommend that. Um, and um, the other What's one I read again? It's In the Valley of the Sun by okay. Andy Davidson. It's Sky Horse Publishing, who now runs Nightshade. Um, but it's an, Sky Horse is the publisher. Um, that was a really, really nice, really literary horror. Really subtle and quiet, but really, uh, really scary and dark. And then um, I also read uh, An Arc of Heaven's Crooked Finger by Hank Early, which is uh, kind of a southern gothic horror mystery thriller thing. Um, that was a lot of fun as well. I don't know if it's out yet or not, but it's a, uh, and Hank Early is the alias for John Mantooth, who's been in the business for a while. But those are both really, I'd highly recommend for people who are looking for something to read. Okay. Well, Gwen, thank you for being on the show. It was really great talking with you. Very, very great to be here. Thank you so much again. This was so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> very nice to meet you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no problem. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next week.